So welcome everyone to Retrofit Talks. I'm Laura Broderick. I'm the Commercial Partnerships Manager at the Building Centre, and I'll be your host for today's session titled Knox Bavon Energy, KBE, a research project and a carbon calculator. But before we hear today's presentation, I just want to tell you a little bit about this online talk series, part of Retrofit 23 at the Building Centre, designed to connect professionals and discuss residential retrofit. We're here to showcase the latest research and projects from architectural practice, offering valuable case studies and solutions for retrofitting our homes. Our guest speakers will present their projects. These will be followed by a Q&A session with you, our webinar audience. This is our second Retrofit Talks event. And if you missed last week's with Fathom Architect, Paul Lee and Elliot Wood Engineers, you can catch up with the recording via the Building Centre's website or YouTube channel. But back to today. Our speaker today is Ben Hare, project architect from the award-winning South London-based practice, based practice Knox Bavon. Ben leads on sustainability for the practice and has developed KBE, a carbon tool, a research project, and a carbon calculator that examines, communicates, and reduces, reduces the embodied carbon in the practices projects. We'll be hearing from Ben for about 20 minutes. He'll be sharing KBE analysis, case studies and aspirations, and then he will take your questions. So thank you all for listening to this introduction. I'm now delighted to hand over to Ben. Hi everyone, thanks very much for having me. Um, and thanks Laura for the introduction. I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, there we go. So today I'm going to be talking on three projects, not necessarily uh, chronologically. Um, and I'm going to be talking about those through the lens of uh, the embodied carbon research we've been doing and our kind of attempts to understand what sustainability means for us and what the challenges of that are for our practice. So I'm going to start um, talking about the building that I'm sat in now, which is our office in Peckham, and how we began this kind of journey of trying to understand our carbon footprint. Um, this was a retrofit project that started in 2014-15 when we moved from our old office that was kind of a five minute walk away from this office to this building, which was our old stationary supplier. And it had a big um, footprint at the back, which we kind of gutted the building, took the floors out. So it was a really deep retrofit taking out the kind of rabbit warren of walls and different kind of floor levels that were all over the place in the old building and creating our new studio space which sits at the back of the building in this larger footprint with lots of natural light and storage and the custom built table in the middle that allows us to stand up and sit down so the whole office was kind of focused around wellness and it was yeah a very rare opportunity to experiment as well as architects you know you're quite often um, I don't want to say curtailed, but curtailed by uh, either a, a budget, a client, or a you know some kind of uh, a fear that you're not experimenting with your own building. And here we were experimenting with our own building, so we maybe got to do a bit more here than we usually would. So we, the whole building is uh, airtight and powered by solar panels, and we kind of experimented with different floor constructions. So there's a lot of bespoke items going on here that were us trying to play with kind of glass floors, timber composite floors, um, and a new space in the below the building that allowed us to have presentations where we talk about our sustainability um, and a meeting room above. And there's a flat above where I'm sat here that is also part of the building and a new concrete picture frame window out the front, which really engages with the street. And this is before we filled this with models from the workshop and school kids now come and look at the models and that's the front of the building now so the building in and of itself was really um it's successful in that we all kind of love working here and we knew it was a successful space for us as a practice um but what we knew less about was how the um what the carbon footprint of the building was and when architects claire kind of emerged and the world and the uh construction industry became more aware of its carbon footprint we started to look at this building and see how it was performing and all of the operational stuff we felt like it was very um relatively easy for us to get a quick handle on how the building was doing so the whole top that this building is covered in pvs so 
first thing about these graphs looking at our energy usage since we moved in is to say that the average energy use across the year doesn't fluctuate massively with the seasons, which kind of tells us that the air tightness and the high levels of insulation we've got in here are working really as we designed to make sure there's not stronger heating loads and more energy use at different times of year. And also shows us that our PV output is nearly kind of ac accounting for all of our energy use in the summer, which is great. And obviously in the winter, that can't be the case with changing the seasons. And there, with the integration of the MVHR, we translated those, um, those metrics of energy use to see how they're comparing against the LETI standards, the London Energy Transformation Initiative, which at the time and still are the kind of, I think, the best standard to work to in, in terms of sustainable design. So with the, the LETI standard is 50 uh, kilowatt hours per meter square per year. And we were working at 77 in this building, which is an office that has slightly higher use anyway, and a small office as well. But with our energy generated on site included into that, we are kind of hitting those standards. So we kind of felt like we knew where we were going in an operational sense and what, um, how to make our buildings work day to day, but we didn't, we knew much less about this, which was the embodied carbon, which is all the energy that is spent on the building before anyone moves in. So how much does concrete take? How much does the steel take? How much does the bricks take? How much does the plywood potentially sequester? And we started looking at great tools by Field and Clegg Bradley and Hawkins Brown at the time, the HBERT tool and the FCBS carbon counts. And they were really, really informative and helped us understand the methodology, but they, it was very difficult to apply those tools to our scale of practice, given that the scale of floors we're looking at is completely different. And the fact that all three of these floors have a completely different buildup and the one above this has a different buildup because retrofitting kind of sometimes demands that of you, that you've got to have a flexibility in how you design and you can't, um, you have to work with what's already there. So we started doing a, we undertook a kind of audit of lots of our completed projects to see what the embodied carbon of all of them was and how they compared. And we knew that we could never be 100% accurate with them, but the idea was that the more we have to compare, then the comparison was really helpful and the measuring of the carbon would kind of flag bits where we were more carbon heavy than we'd like to be. And that also created a library of different buildups per meter squared and what their embodied carbon was. For those so the idea there was that at planning stage or at early stages, we could talk to a client about how their choice of brick or zinc or timber or how we built the wall could impact the whole life carbon of their building. And the final part of that, of, well, not the final, but the most recent part of that was trying to communicate all of that and developing a carbon dial that balanced sequestered carbon against embodied carbon and appreciated the um, existing materials. So this is this building where the yellow pieces in here are the walls and bits of the roof that were retained. And then everything else here is the carbon emitting elements um, that uh, form the new building. And the sequestering elements we kind of massively undervalue. There's probably a few more here than is shown here, but it started to give us a dial and a number that we could compare per meter squared from building to building. So we could see if some of our buildings may be more carbon heavy than others. And in doing that, we realized that, you know, we're going in the right direction and that we're achieving the Letty values. Um, but it also kind of shows you, it invites you to ask, what is this big bit of the pie and how can we reduce that proportionally within the building? Um, the final part of like understanding what this tool is, was the engagement side of it. So we've in a few small public projects that we work on, we find it really helpful to translate these metrics into drives from London to Edinburgh or flights from London to Sydney for the equivalent average UK household emissions so that people can put that in real terms. So I think one of the biggest learning points we've had on the on learning about our carbon footprint is that it's the communication of it as much as the challenge as understanding what it is or putting a number to it. So I'm now gonna to move to a different retrofit project that was a project I was running at the time of developing that, uh, what we now call KBE research. And this was a, a part Victorian building with lots of different uh, extensions on the back. So all of this was kind of single skin brickwork and all different floor levels. And then this section of the building um, was a 90s extension. And then this was a kind of, 
block work garage. So what we were doing was working in a conservation area of the existing house in South London, extending to give some more accommodation and improve the fabric and creating a kind of contemporary extension at the back. So there were all different kinds of build up going here, but retaining lots of the built fabric that was already there. And that kind of highlighted all these challenges of retrofit that are scary, but kind of brilliant as well, that you have all these challenges of retention. And we found when we opened up to the brickwork that it wasn't what we thought it was. And you kind of see this, the tail of the building. Um, this is a very boring image, but just showing, you know, showing all that insulation that you put in in a fabric first approach that we took to retrofit combined with newer technologies and this building has an air source heat pump and it was relatively new to us to see how an air source heat pump would work within with existing fabric where you know we're re-insulating bits of the fabric but ultimately a lot of it is as it was and also i think it's one of the great challenges in design in for us in retrofit is trying to the regulatory side of um achieving compliance in existing buildings, especially on a smaller scale like ours, where you have an existing area where the staircase has to go and trying to create something that's beautiful and light, but also complies and is also, you know, fitting the client's brief. And this is that contemporary extension, which has a kind of Douglas fir roof with a slender steel and the, all the lighting is integrated into this. So it, there's a kind of nice conversation you can have about how the kind of contemporary architecture meets existing old Victorian architecture. And you end up with this. This is during the construction where the new brickwork had gone up and had a bit of effervescence that's gone now. And then the Victorian piece. And then over here, what's off screen is the kind of 80s, 90s extension to the house. And then our piece of the house that was coming on here. I had a talk. I went to a talk at the AJ last year where someone talked about um, retrofit pieces as being kind of life support machines for buildings where they plug in and they help the old fabric work better and that's kind of a lot of what happened here so this is these are very recently taken photos and they're not um i took them on my phone last week so i suppose they're not great but you kind of start to see that tapestry of different building parts working together um and that works on a macro scale as well whereby at the back we managed to do something very contemporary that related really well with the garden, but at the front, the extension is much more of the conservation area and there's a stitching in at street scale level as well as, you know, the brick scale level. And marrying all these different bricks where you go from 2023 to maybe 1850 to uh, 1990 and then back to 2023. And that's a fun conversation and fun design challenge to have as an architect in a and it's also a great opportunity to add to, I know this talk is about retrofit, but the biodiversity you can bring along. We were, um, we've always been skeptical about how much biodiversity a seed and roof can actually bring. Cause it is, it can be somewhat of a, you know, a monoculture, but we put this roof on and it bloomed in a beautiful yellow way and was covered in bees the first week. And then you get more, <laughs> maybe less wanted biodiversity guests turning up, but it was really exciting. Um, this here is a copper breeze soleil that prevents overheating of what is quite a glazed elevation. Um, so I'm just going to talk about some of the challenges we reached, we came across in retrofitting this building. And this image on the left shows the neighbouring uh, foundations for the Victorian villa next door. And this was the spec, what the NHBC National House Builders spec said we had to put in as a foundation because we were near a tree. And there is a real kind of regulatory challenge in designing and engineering in a way that is appropriate for the scale, which this house was built 200 years ago on these foundations and hasn't really moved. Um, and we got around that and managed to speak to the engineer about kind of creatively engineering to save more carbon there. And then there's all the challenges that we all know about, about how Yes, the green grant was in place, but we weren't allowed, we couldn't insulate as much because we couldn't access the green grant, green grant and many of the, those funds um, haven't been claimed. And then obviously the VAT conversation, which is moving in the right direction. I think events like this are great for moving that in the right direction. Um, but this analysis that we did recently showed, you know, more and more of the existing fabric being retained. So ideally on this dial, the 
yellow would start to grow and grow as we get better at working with existing and the green grows as we use more and more passive materials. And that's the embodied carbon count for Love Wall, um, for the house in South London, sorry. Um, and the precursor to that project was this project, which is a house in Kent where it had a similar kind of plug-in life support machine to this building, which was a, I think a 16th or 17th century house that needed new accommodation and, you know, to make it suitable as a house that you could entertain and everything. And I kind of go in full circle in that this building down here is a proposal now that we have for um, uh, accommodation for carers who are going to move in and help the people who live here. And this building here is actually our old office that we moved to before this one. So this is the kind of reuse part where we're taking what was our old office here um, and moving it to be alongside this one of Dr. Farn's early projects that informed the house in South London. And this was that office that we all worked in, or this was quite, this was a bit before I worked there, but it was there for kind of the designed and built kind of 30 years ago. And now it's been dismantled and all the steel has been taken away and as much as the block work and all of the glass and doors has been saved. And we're gonna move, this was the, the original section of the building. And this again speaks to the challenge of retrofit and reuse, where you see the levels of insulation here. And then when it's moved, this is the level of insulation we're gonna be putting in to make it, um, up to the standards that we now um, know are what we need to have really sustainable buildings. Um, and that construction there is bringing in cassette construction that we've used on uh, March House, which people may have seen, um, which won the Manx Medal last year. So this is a kind of uh, SIPS panel that is um, prefabricated and is gonna be used alongside the old steel frame. And that's a, uh, that kind of shows the original bits of building being put into new one and all the slates and cladding will go over the top of this new carbon sequestering construction. And there it'll sit alongside the old house. Um, so that, I feel like I've gone very quickly, but that was a kind of rough run around of from where we were about learning about sustainability and practice to retrofit to reuse. And in that we've kind of started to get to this question of well, this was our studio that was built, designed and built uh, nearly seven or eight years ago now. We we're at 397 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared. And then this is a building, uh, the house that I showed in South London, that is use it retaining more and more of the existing fabric. And we're getting down to 275 kilograms CO2 per meter squared. And that we're increasing the green, increasing the yellow, and trying to bring this up. Uh, orange side down um, and it leads you to that question is if we're if we're going from 397 to 275 maybe the next one is 200 maybe the one after that is 100 and then you ask yourself is it possible to build a carbon negative building and on that these are the kind of key lessons we've learned one is that the travel really counts in all of these materials so where we can't we can't say exactly where every single screw that goes into the building comes from we can use the analysis we've done with KBE, KBE to highlight what are the carbon heavy parts of this building and let's find out why and let's see where are they coming from. So for example, this is just looking at the carbon footprint of freight transport for a new, a new house that we're doing in Peckham. And the difference is, and this is just the from ferry port to ferry port, so obviously there would be emissions in the UK. But we found that a company we had worked with before, a uh, brick supplier, they uh, produced this very, what they called a very authentic London stock. And on speaking to them, we found that that London stock was actually made in China of Chinese aggregates and was imported all the way to the UK, where it won awards for being an authentic London stock. And that's a really interesting kind of like nugget of what the sustainability question for us is because you will have planners or planning authorities that um, may request a what looks like a London buff brick and that comes all the way from the other side of the world and there's a kind of the the notion of what localism is I think is changing somewhat and where materials come from so that's just something that we found really interesting the second is that the new has to work with the old and I put these two photos in one showing that all the buildings, so the house I showed doesn't have a heat recovery system, but the building here that I'm in has a heat recovery system and all of that ductwork and the kind of 
the technical um, the technical need of buildings now is much higher. So there has to be this kind of appreciation of how do we integrate those technologies together in a way that is seamless, that isn't seen, that um, kind of talks of this picture where we're going from a London that used to burn coal all the time, every day from every house that could afford it to smaller heat recovery systems that can serve each house. Um, and the last bit is, uh, this is a kind of, not to be taken too seriously, the numbers that are on here, but you can't count everything. And we certainly appreciate that we can't count everything in the analysis we're doing. And we make big kind of, we mark everything up by 10% to account for what we're not counting, with the bits we're missing, and then another 10% for the wastage. Um, because of the scale of analysis we're doing and the reality of construction is you can't count everything. And this slide kind of shows that in that um, every time I try and get my head back into the spreadsheets, that inform that carbon dial idea kind of you end up doing like a kind of warm-up exercise where you remember how the maths work and this i was on site the other day on a new house that we're working on and they're just a lot of the people who work on site smoke and so i wondered what the embodied carbon of those cigarettes was and the average so each cigarette is 14 grams of embodied carbon so if you're a smoker that is how much you are costing the world every time you have a cigarette um, aside from your health. And then the average smoker in the UK smokes 10 cigarettes a day. So if we have five uh, people on site who smoke um, five days a week, that counts to 182 kilograms of CO2 if they're working on site for a year, which could be 385 bricks for us that we can leave off our carbon count, which is a completely ludicrous calculation. But it kind of tells that story of how you have to be aware and be cognizant of the fact you can't count everything, but and that kind of leads to this quote, which I think sums up perfectly, that it's, it's certainly impossible to build a carbon negative building. It's a kind of contradiction in terms, just the question. But the pursuit of it is um, worthwhile and important and what we should be all be striving for as architects. Um, the last bit I'll say is that we, there are so many blind spots in sustainability and trying to understand your carbon impact. So, if anyone, and we're interested in getting more and more people involved in a kind of small practice network that want to work with us on Knox Bavarian Energy, this kind of research project. So if anyone is interested in collaborating or having us assess some of their projects, please email me at my emails there. Um, the last thing I said, I, I, what I thought I should say was the, as a reference, this book, uh, Residential Retrofit, Retrofit by Marianne Bailey is brilliant. And I just thought I should mention that because it it has a lot of answers to the questions about condensation of insulating old fabric and different approaches to uh, insulating old buildings. So that's, if nothing else taken away, get this book because I think it's brilliant. Um, but thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, I'm just going to jump in now for the Q&A aspect, but um, brilliant presentation. It was fantastic to hear. So thank you. Um, and just a reminder, I know we've got one question sitting in the Q&A, but now's your time. I mean, I know Ben's shared his email very kindly, but we'd also like to make use of the next 10, 15 minutes to have him answer some questions live. So if you do want to address something to Ben, please do type it in that Q&A. Uh, again, just a reminder, try and keep it um, short and sweet rather than huge statements for us. Um, so yeah, you can take a few moments to think, type that in. Um, but for now, Ben, shall I um, give you the first question that is already in the Q&A? Um, yeah. So this is coming and it might require you to jump back a slide or two um, from Vicky at TP Bennett. So I assume another architect addressing this to you. Um, she wondered, could you zoom back in on the carbon dial? Um, I think she's interested yeah. to know quite how that works in a bit more detail. So just the constituent parts, how yeah, you actually sure. used it for the analysis. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect of her question. And then she's also asking about um, reuse of timber and do you ensure that timber is demountable in projects? So that's the second part of her question. Brilliant. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, so the, the dials that shown here are kind of stripped back presentation version. So it's not so much kind of call outs on the screen, but we're, I'm still not sure about the best way to split up the pie, basically. Well, the way we do it at the moment is substructure, superstructure. 
we do it kind of by building elements so walls floor roof and i don't know if that may be a bit can you see if i zoom there is that working for you yeah so these um so there's a kind of all the for example the screed and everything is in the floors and the, if there's a slab that will probably be in the substructure and each of these has a number to them that we can then look at and then but these are all basically project specific so for example on uh the house in south london it's got that copper breeze soleil, which we were really interested in understanding the carbon footprint of that versus a timber breeze soleil that you have to replace so um that's how those are working but the i still wonder from time to time whether it'd be better to split it into uh materials which we have and we can do in a we can move it you know change the metrics here to have it displayed differently so you might have bricks concrete steel um but i um i don't know i kind of jump between the two as to which is the more uh interesting or more there's two things one is you want to know as the specifier or as the architect which materials are costing you the most but you also want to know from project to project like well the walls on this project are performing much better in terms of body carbon than the walls on this project, which is why we have it in this format at the moment. But it's a moving feast, is what I would say. I hope that answers the question. Uh, and Ben, just before you um, answer the second bit of Vicky's question about the timber um, reuse. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. But I think it's interesting just while you're zoomed in on that. Um, how do your colleagues find using this? You're obviously the sustainability lead in the practice, mm. but you're a, a small practice, even a micro practice uh, you know and um, so how do you as a team use it and have worked together to develop it as you say iron out so, the detail and yeah that's a good question i but i the development of the dial happened very much in house in the i i would produce these graphs initially when we'd done a bit of carbon analysis in the building and show it to the office and i would kind of expect that people would understand what the graph was showing immediately and it really and it struck for me how because when you have your head in the spreadsheets the whole time you come out with a few numbers you really know it it's it's almost like when you're doing a new university project and you have a crit and you try and explain what you've put into your building and you're trying to translate it and people in the office really didn't i well, i wasn't communicating it well initially at all so the development of this as a way of showing um trying to explain the carbon footprint really came from you know conversations with colleagues about them saying this doesn't really communicate properly at the moment what you're trying to say and having to talk them into it because you really want something that is almost like at the moment i'm kind of seeing this as like a it's like the health data for the building so you know how people have apple watches and it shows like how many steps they've done and how many calories they've eaten and this is in the same way building should be about balance and that you should try and balance your greens and your yellows and your oranges like balance the traffic lights and that's where i think it's going at the moment um on the demountable timber yeah that's definitely something that we are looking more and more and you kind of in reusing the project i was showing uh this project so this whole piece of the breeze soleil here came off in one go but not through arguably through the design that designed 30 years ago and wasn't designed for the idea it'd be taken down but the process of taking down a building more than anything else has in like really affirmed to us how challenging it is to demount timber and how it needs to be designed in um the cassette construction though that we'll use uh so this construction so all of these cassettes those are um which you put there's no uh, screw, there's no mechanical fixings and there's no glue between those. So it's just kind of pieces of plywood that slot together. So in terms of demounting those, it's very, very simple. And then to get the raw materials out again, is very, very simple. So it's something we're definitely looking at more and more. Great, thank you, Ben. And we've had some more questions come in, which is fantastic. Um, so somebody has asked, where do you gather the data from for the calculations? Like, can you go into a bit more detail about just the- Yeah, so the, I'll just go back to, uh, if anyone wants to get in touch. Um, the, so there's two sides to the data. One is like very much doing a QS's job 
and going through and measuring different parts of the building. And as a small practice, we have some projects that, and retrofit is an interesting uh, mm -hmm. part of this in that in some projects, particularly new build projects where we're doing cassette construction, we'll have a complete, almost complete BIM model of the project. So taking off values and quantities off that is very easy. And then translating that into the carbon um, is much simpler. But then equally, we have retrofit projects where we're working more in 2D in a traditional way of drawing because we're working with existing buildings and you know more two-dimensional surveys. So that is much more of a uh, QS exercise and counting how many bricks you're going to need or um, all that kind of thing. And we're starting to think about we're running a project where we're project managing and we're doing all the materials for a house in Peckham and I think I'd love to be able to do an analysis where I know that other I think um, there's a few practices working on this idea of taking basically all the receipts that come in on that job and using that as a way of quantifying exactly how many materials you've used so you almost you do it financially but you can also do it as a kind of audit in a um, carbon sense then so that's the measuring all the stuff and then knowing how much carbon all that stuff is used comes from our main uh resources the ice database by circular ecology which was a, a research project that anyone can download by i think the university of bar and circular ecology and one other person who i should remember but they that has all the kind of all the values for different materials and we'd use a lot of that but it doesn't account often for travel distances and more specific kind of timber sourcing and that kind of thing so if we know we've got a building that's using a lot of brick we'll go into more detail and try and get an epd on that brick so epds are i'm sure there's a few people that know them environmental product declarations and they'll i think they're becoming a much bigger part of building and they tell you the cradle to grave embodied carbon of different products. And the more the architects are pressuring suppliers to give EPDs, the more likely they will be to produce them. So if I can encourage anyone to press their suppliers for EPDs, that would be good. Amazing. Thank you, Ben. It's quite interesting for the building centre between the manufacturers and the design professionals thinking about things like EPDs as well. So and yeah. um, moving on to next question um, from Craig Wilson. I'm just going to read this straight out. Um, you had one example on screen with three different wall buildups. In the example, the timber clad buildup had the best lifetime performance versus zinc and the other. How do you reconcile that against the increased annual maintenance that the timber would, would require over the lifetime of the project? So that's a great question. Um, and I think on that slide, the, I'll go back to the look at it. It's like, yeah, but that, uh, so I should say, first of all, that that slide is from, is quite, that was a kind of early part of the, when we were analysing these things. So, these may have changed now in the way that we understand what timber is and what the zinc is. But the first part on that, when we were looking at it, was this building, which is a threefold house in Richmond, which um, is, is just one of RBA wars. It's a new uh, house on a brownfield site in Richmond. And the building is this kind of floating zinc uh, element above a brick perimeter wall below and there are buildings that you do the carbon analysis on and you think yeah this is going to be good so when we did March House we knew that it was all timber construction and everything above the um, uh, galvanized steel deck was timber so you're kind of keen to do that analysis to see how well the building's done whereas this building I was much more I think architects have a similar kind of anxiety that you have a lot of carbon shaped skeletons in your closet about how much carbon you've emitted in your career of building things so this building that is its outward appearance is black and it looks as it, it to me it looked as if it would be very carbon heavy because it's metal and it's plastic but actually the the construction behind it is all timber framed and um very lightweight and the performance really isn't very bad when you compare it to a, what is a much more traditional masonry building so that was one thing that i kind of took from this um, and on, I can't remember the person's, person's name, but on their question, 
there's definitely a consideration that should be made for the zinc really has got probably a 60, 80, 100 year design life has provided its detail correctly and that these panels aren't really going to pull away. Whereas the timber here uh, similarly needs to be replaced. Um, there is, I think you have to be very careful because some uh, models will say that if you have to replace this timber cladding every 20 years, then you get that benefit every 20 years of sequestering more carbon. And there is a, there is some logic to that, but I think there is a danger that you are, you end up specifying timber for the sake of sequestering an imagined amount of body carbon. And so all of our, the long and the short of it is that all of our analysis ends at practical completion at the moment. So we won't consider the fact, unless you are having to replace, for example, a zinc a bit of cladding every five years, which would just be a terribly designed building, not one that hopefully we've authored, that we're not considering considering replacing the timber cladding every 20 years and seeing that as another win every 20 years. But equally, if you are having to paint your building every 20 years, you should consider that as that's a continual negative effect on the user, first of all, but the uh, carbon emissions, secondly. So there's a there's a kind of tension there, I guess, between our desire as a practice to work with self-finishing materials and materials that don't need maintenance. Um, and the opposite of that, which is a lot of buildings that go up are requiring regular painting or rendering or different maintenance. But it's a great question. But my answer first of all would be that this slide was a kind of work in progress and not necessarily reflecting how we measure carbon. Thanks, Ben. And thanks, everyone, for your questions. And um, we've got two more that are in. So I think I'll put those to you, Ben, and then we'll uh, wrap up the session. But as you've left your email address, you know, people can follow up with you that way. But we'll take the last two that are in. So this is from Hutt. Um, have you tried measuring the benefit of adding elements that increase embodied carbon in order to save operational carbon? Can you give time and years for payback? It's quite a big one to answer, but you're happy to take that one. Yeah, it's a yeah. <laughs> great question. And it's really, um, the it's something that I've got really interested in, in doing the analysis of the House of South London for this uh, webinar. And I think there's two parts of the strand here. One is that, so the kind of horror, well, I should, maybe I shouldn't say horrible, but the, the nastier materials used to insulate building like expanders, foams, and you know, what aren't natural materials are way better performing, but way worse in terms of embodied carbon than a wood fiber insulation or a you know a mineral wool insulation. And that's a really interesting question about where is the where's the where's the the sweet spot between we want to use a nice natural material and the wall construction that isn't 500 mil thick to achieve the same U value as having 100 mil of an expanded foam. Um, on, but on your question that was, how do we find the sweet spot between the embodied carbon and the operational carbon? Um, Again, it kind of comes back to the question of, or, or why we started doing all of this instead of using uh, the bigger practice tools was that each project requires so much specificity and even more so on um, the, the insulation of retrofitted buildings. So it's something we are starting to do and we've done it um, we know how much energy this building uses each year and how much energy this building uses each year. And once we have the data for the, pro the house that's just finished that I showed, that will be a great one to really test how well the building is performing in terms of energy. And we can put numbers to that against the SAP calculations we've done to see, well, if we were to insulate more or insulate, you know, more completely, when would the payback of that been? 
but again on existing buildings you have to balance it against the, the actual space because you're working with small victorian properties a lot of the time that you can't live in a little shoebox that is like you can't wear a jumper six jumpers all year round when you're inside the building and not be able to move because there's so much insulation over it Thanks, Ben, and thanks to whoever from Hook put that forward. Um, I have seen there's a, a cheeky a cheeky extra question pop in, so let's see if we can manage them both, if you're all right, for another five minutes, Ben. Yeah, sure. um, so one around the practice, which is something you you know started with, that you've developed this a lot as a bespoke thing for a small studio, but in that respect, somebody from Mole Architects, how is Knox Bavon funding this research? So how does it work practically? the time and the dedication to doing this. Do you want to say a little bit on that? Mm. Uh, yeah, practically we are, it is ultimately just time and time is the kind of, even more than money is the kind of most precious resource of the architects, I think. And it is, we're, I'm just doing it alongside uh, running the projects and I've been really fortunate that the practice has really supported that and um, is keen to learn more and more. I think I think the only way you can, well, there are a few ways to kind of con you, to continue the energy of measuring how much energy you're using. One is doing talks and going to talks like this. So we started just going to seminars and as much as we could to really, um, get us thinking and then now doing talks every time I do one I kind of feel that I need to do I have to update and do a bit more of the analysis which is great because it kind of um, keeps it ticking along but also I would just encourage anyone or everyone to just take little bits of the building each time so for example we start I started with the embodied carbon calculation in this building where we have a concrete picture frame window and we were looking to measure our sustainability. And we've got an office that's got a big bit of concrete right on the front of it. That was there was a kind of a bit of uh, I don't know tension in that. And I just did that on the side, which was a kind of half an hour exercise, which anyone can kind of spare to you know to start get themselves thinking about it. Um, we're working in terms of funding it going forward, though. As we invite more and more practices to work with us, we would think we started thinking about whether we do a rate that's like a, a pound per square meter that people could uh, put forward to pay for us to do the analysis with them, and that would be really good because it'd be you know fifty quid if you had a or fifteen pounds if you had an extension that you wanted to check and four hundred pounds if you had a four hundred square meter school and like that. I think there's a real key to making it accessible in a financial sense for us to do and for people to use. But I think the ultimate answer to the question of how we fund it is that we find spare time where we can. Yeah, I'm thinking, not saying that you're a smoker, Ben, I've done, no idea, but all the factories <laughs> need to disappear from yeah. practice life. And that needs to go into data analysis on this. So, <laughs> um, but back to your final and serious question. Um, this is your last one, Ben, from Laura at Cullinan Studio. And she's asking about the design stages. So how does this analysis inform what you're doing in design stages and early stages in particular in Reba stage two and then into three? How does that work? Um, I wonder if, I don't know if I, no, if I was going to try and find an, another piece to share but it would be take a bit too long but there the way we've we see it work a lot of what we have with this analysis is a kind of vision of how it could work rather than completely practical examples of how it does work but in reba stages kind of zero through to two or zero to one i think there's a huge opportunity to do carbon analysis on all the existing fabric on a site or a project or I, I think that it could just be it would be amazing if we had say Southwark Council as a client and we were sent to do embodied carbon analysis on all of their buildings that they have and then suddenly there's like a in that a new value that is given to existing existing buildings seen as kind of carbon sinks and then a new appreciation for existing building stock which I think is really missing because there is this kind of presumption of knock down and build something better and then going into stage 
uh, two, three, two and three. So at planning and kind of pre-app, there's a kind of optioneering uh, exercise where we, on the carbon dial, we would have rings for kind of three different options. And that would be like option A, option B, option C. And those can be then measured against, you know, the financial cost of the different options or the different claddings and the kind of aesthetic uh, vision for the project. So um, I can send the kind of mock-up of what we think those look like over to uh, Lara. Um, and then the next stage is the on the in the specification. So when the tenders and the kind of stage four documents are being drawn up, all the documentation that would go to a QS or out tender could be tendered on a carbon sense as well. So maybe before you tender, there would be a set where we get the full building specification that is pretty involved by stage four. And we could say, look, this is what your carbon uh, footprint is going to be at for this building in embodied carbon terms. How does that compare to what you wanted to be at at stage one, two, and three? And do we do a, a value engineering exercise that isn't in cutting away things in terms of financial costs, but seeing where we can save carbon? Um, and then obviously there is the post-occupancy side, which is the way we've done it with uh, the house in South London, which is what the majority of our analysis has been to this point, which is starting to inform stages zero to five now. Great. Thank you, Ben. I think we'll wrap up Ben and close the questions, but thank you everyone for the great questions and keep talking to Ben. He shared his email address before. Maybe Ben, you could just um, put that last slide up again so people can see your email. Um, but Ben, thank you to you obviously for for giving that presentation it was brilliant and i know you said that retrofitting can be scary but brilliant but i really think you showed the brilliance there so appreciate you taking the time um to regroup and make the presentation for everyone um, so yeah, do keep in touch with Ben. Um, the webinar will be available shortly. We've been recording it, so it will be up on the YouTube channel um, and on Building Centre's website under this event link. Um, so if you want to share that with friends or colleagues who missed today, um, please do that. That would be much appreciated. Um, and then to learn more about our whole Retrofit 23 exhibition and programme, please visit the website. That's buildingcentre.co.uk. Um, and then just in terms of future events, uh, please mark your calendars for our next lunchtime online session, our next retrofit talk, which will be on the 6th of June. We've got Dr. Tom Woolley giving that one and he'll be discussing air tightness, insulation and air quality. Um, so you can book for free via the Eventbrite links that are on our website for those events. And Ben, I know you mentioned Marion Bailey's book. She's giving a talk. I can't remember the date off the top of my head, but she's also in that lineup of events that are running online until the end of September. Um, so look out for that. And then if you are based in London and can attend in person, we do have some in-person meetups. Um, they're taking place on Wednesday evenings, starting next Wednesday. That's the 31st of May. They're labelled Retrofit Meets, um, and we're starting with a panel discussion on social housing. So if you can make it next week, do book for that. And if you're looking for something more informal or you're working with community groups or residents associations through your practice life, we're hosting a cafe retrofit on Monday, the 5th of June afternoon for World Environment Day. So that's a kind of more informal drop in session over the course of an afternoon at the building centre. And we've got um, representatives from Leeds Beckett University, the Sustainability, Sustainability Institute, from QBOT and from Arup all on hand to sort of meet and greet and discuss domestic retrofitting then. And again, that's free and can be booked on our events programme. So there's lots to look out for. Um, but today, Ben, you were great. Thank you so much for taking the time and thank you to your practice for, for dedicating your time to, to the KBE tool. Um, it's a great resource for small practices and for others as well. So thank you. And thank you all great. for tuning in and uh, we wish you a great rest, rest of your day. So bye for now. <laughs> bye. Right. Thanks, Laura. Thanks everyone. Bye.